<laughs> Welcome everyone to the new Fly Fisher. I'm Phil Rowley. And I'm Tom Rosenbauer. Today we're coming to you from Red Deer, Alberta. And we're joined by Dave Jensen from Fly Fish, Alberta. And this area is known for its wonderful brown trout fisheries. And together we're going to show you how to hunt trout on these great western waters. It's going to be a great show. Stick around. Go back to live another day. And away he goes. Great fish. Wow. Oh, baby. Look at that fish. Stop, wiggle, and away down. On today's show, the new fly fisher is based out of Red Deer, Alberta. It is located roughly halfway between the capital city of Edmonton to the north and the stampede city of Calgary to the south. Red Deer is a small city with a population of just over 90,000 people, perfectly situated to target the numerous trout streams of the south central part of the province. Red Deer is a metropolitan city, complete with shopping amenities, attractions, parks, including heritage parks, a nature center, and lots of accommodation options. As with many destinations, a quick visit or call to the local tourism office is recommended. The region is also home to a variety of wildlife, including birds such as geese and waxwings, along with muskrat, deer and elk. Dave Jensen. Together with wife Amelia, they own and operate Fly Fish Alberta Guide Service. Dave has a wealth of experience, not only on central and southern Alberta streams, but in particular hunting trout. His skills have been honed on his local rivers and on the crystal clear waters of New Zealand. Dave has developed an almost supernatural ability to spot fish. Tom and I are both looking forward to our time on the water with Dave. Our trip has been blessed. Mayflies are hatching in good numbers, including Hexagena. Hexagena, or Hex as they are known to many, is a huge mayfly. They spend up to three years as a nymph before they swim to the surface to emerge. Upon hatching, the large adults drift downstream. They provide a huge morsel that even the largest trout find hard to resist. Hex spinners are equally effective, perfect for our hunting trout theme. When I'm sight fishing for brown trout, I'm looking in the typical areas where I know the brown trout are going to live. That's going to be along woody debris, that's going to be in deep troughs where the current slows down, and it's also going to be at the head of and inside of seams during a good hatch. And the last thing I, I look for, especially on undercut banks, is the lower riding fins that are bright yellow most often. And uh, if I'm having a tough time sighting fish, I look right along the edges for those bright yellow fins. So Tom, what we got here today, uh, we're gonna be walking up a tiny little spring creek. And right in front of us here, we have a, a beaver dam that's backed that water up. So it's crystal clear water. Yeah. And what this beaver's done, it's real shallow here, but we're gonna get into kind of a trough as it goes all the way up. Mm -hmm. And on either side, there's a drop off right against the grasses that, that the trout will hold right tight to the grasses, okay. come out, feed, and go back. Okay. Now, they'd be normally they'd be hard to see, mm -hmm. except in this crystal clear water, you can pretty much just walk along real slow, look at the base of the grasses, and walk up. We're looking for heads, pectoral fins, and tails. Okay. On some of the bigger males, they're gonna have that big flagging uh, tail, Right. and that's a dead giveaway that he's there. Okay. When you're hunting trout, it's important to uh figure out what they're feeding on. It just makes fly selection and presentation choice that much easier. And here, just by standing downstream from some perspective water, I've got a good sample of what might be on the menu. This is a big hexagena uh, nymph, uh, a shuck. Look at the size of that thing. We've got a dun, uh, a bit of a cripple. You can see its wings are all beat up, struggling, flopped over in this film. Another one that's uh, 
uh, passed away. This was lying flat. And over here, we've got a PMD spinner. So right away, we can think about imitating hexagena and PMDs. Tom, we have a corner pocket here. We know brown trout are big, fat, and sassy, but they're also lazy. Um, when the time comes to feed, they'll do so, but until then, they're not going to leave this depth of water. Mm -hmm. Right now, we have the biggest fish that's working is sitting right there and uh, at the top end of the bucket. He'll take the biggest stuff, but there's also two more fish that have moved up because we have a PMD hatch, and they're working that seam just in the top end of that seam coming in. Okay, so they move from the deep water up into their current to feed. Yes. Okay. Oh, he's moving. He got him. Yeah. Good show. Good show. Yeah. Wow, nice fish, Tom. Yeah. Watch the mud on angle here. Nice fly. She floats. Here's those banks I was telling you about earlier on the trip. Yeah. Yeah. Thought I could do it. There you go. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's 18, 19. Wow. Thanks, Dave. Great fish. <laughs> Many times when hunting or just prospecting for trout, you are not always able to cast traditionally with your dominant hand. To be consistently successful, you must adapt and learn different casting techniques to handle the conditions. Take the time to practice casting with your weak hand. Performing a back cast laydown, or casting over your opposite shoulder using a crossbody cast. As they say, practice makes perfect. So Dave, tell me about some of these flies we've been using. Well Tom, we got the uh, beadhead peasant tail nymph that we pretty much hang underneath any of these other dry flies that we have. Side, we have the rabbit split emerger, which has been great during the uh, brown drake and hex hatch here. Uh, we also have the stimulator. We use that later at night. Um, the, these fish weren't too shy about anything when the, when the hatch was on. Beside that, we have the gator done. It's basically a huge hexagenia pattern. It, it can be used as a, as a done or, or a spent uh, spinner. Beside that, we have a sparkle PMD done. For the smaller flies. Yeah, we did have a few. PMDs this week. And beside that we have a brown drake spinner. Didn't get a lot of brown drakes this week. Texas kind of took over. And then beside that we have a hopper. Um, you know, it's a great hopper pattern that you have there. Um, this time of year it's early season, so the hopper is a little bit smaller. Mm -hmm. nice. What Tom and I are doing is following one of Dave's great suggestions, and that's working in a pair up the stream bank. 
Tom's in the water right now. He's on the he's on point, if you will, casting to prospective spots or hopefully a rising fish. I'm up on the bank a little bit, especially helpful on a bright sunny day. I have the vantage to see into the water. I can see fish moving laterally, which is a clue they're taking nymphs. So we can not only work them with a dry, we can also hang a small nymph off a dropper and get them that way as well. So we're just going to keep walking up the bank here, prospecting our way along and hopefully catch a few fish. So Dave, off my right shoulder, we've seen a fish rising sporadically here. They seem to be soft, supple rises. Suggests maybe the PMDs we've seen, a spinner or a dun. Um, what about the approach, this trout's window here? Well, the trout's window, obviously that fish lives right underneath that, that clump of sticks there. Heat comes out, drops out of that when the hatch is on. So we have to make sure with this slow water that we don't do, get too close because we're high. Mm -hmm. If that fish should turn and take something slightly downstream, we're going to be staring right at them. So okay. we've got to make sure that we're back and we're covered with these grasses. We're going to use these grasses as a screen okay. uh, for the fish. All right. Yes. Yes. Good fish. Good fish. Yep. Now the fun begins. Good fish. Can we get down there and land them? Because it, it's a steep bank, so we're not quite sure of it, the depth. Yeah, so what, that's, that's deep, all right. It's deep? OK, it's so I'm going to reel up because I've got lots of grass, which is which is dangerous and you should be able to come stand here Phil okay so I'm just going to trouble with these grassy banks is your sea next step roots. maybe your last oh yeah I can see there's a little shoulder here for yeah. me to get down on perfect absolutely perfect oh yeah but she's steep so again that fish lateral line Dave as well I think yeah I think so got it got its attention made yep. a turn little twitch and and again, you, you've talked to us about the tip slack, where the line's coming back and we get this bow of line under the rod tip yeah, if you stay that on the top fish of that, exploits. Yeah. So yeah. as soon as that line hits, you're almost stripping in like a streamer just to yeah. stay tight with the drift. Definitely strip in, gorgeous lower your rod fish. tip. And... That's a gorgeous fish. Whoa, Whoa. Dave, don't go swimming. <laughs> yeah, speaking of that bank, hey? <laughs> Yeah. He's not too impressed. Well done, Dave. Well done. Nice fish. So we'll just let this uh, fish go back. But there you go. The understanding the trout's window helps you determine how close you've got to be. And it's best to, as Dave says, protect the edge, not only with the line, but with the fly as well. Work your way in. The little trout sees it, comes up and takes it confidently. Just let that beautiful fish back to his home under the logs. What a great fish. Nice cast. Did. Yeah, that worked well. Nice cast. Protecting the edge is making sure that you don't just get into position and hammer a cast right on top of the fish. If you think a fish is at a certain spot, work your way in. Lay the fly line back about five, five, six feet. Get that fly into position. Lay it out nicely. And make sure that you're not overextending your boundaries. Always leave that fly line back downstream of the fly. On today's show, we use 4X and 5X leaders ranging from 12 to 14 feet long, depending on water clarity. The clearer the water, the longer the leader. It is easy to construct a 14-foot leader by taking a 12-foot leader and adding two feet of equal or lesser diameter tippet. Once you're near the tippet knot, you know it's time to add tippet once again to maintain the overall leader length. Okay, Dave, you know, normally most people when they uh, fish rivers and streams, 9-foot, 12-foot or max. I know you're an advocate of 12-foot minimum. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I see obvious reasons for water clarity. What's some other reasons we have that nice long leader? Um, generally I like to go 12, 14 foot in this. The water flow is really slow. Mm -hmm. You got a spring creek that's absolutely you know, crystal clear water. Yep. Fish is going to see everything. Uh, being brown trout, they're going to hear everything. They're going to know what's going on. Their lateral lines on the brown trout versus any other trout, they're really keyed in. They know okay. what's hitting the water and you don't want to overcommit. Okay. Um, so it's a little bit of extension. There's it's a, a little extension. I've got, I'm, what, so 
I don't have to make such a long cast because I've got that leader turning over and an element of stealth to that leader exactly. length as well. But if you go to an 18 foot leader, like you know New Zealand kind of fishers, <laughs> still you, water fishing, yeah, <laughs> you don't get the you don't get the accuracy. No, in that 12 14 uh, foot zone, you have the ability to get the fly to turn over without pounding it and without losing control at okay. either end of the spectrum. Excellent. Okay. It's right in that zone. So that makes sense then. So we've got a fish up here targeted. We're going to move up and give it a shot. You might even Oh yeah, there it is. There it is. That's There's the, one. the fish. That's the one we've There's been There's the one we've been watching. There's the one. So I'm going to keep He's coming right. He's going to try that's the one we wanted. So yes. again, great tip there. Day, I was trying to pinch the line off to let it slingshot over because I was concerned about, you know, splatting the fish and you end up doing exactly what you don't want to do. Let the line shoot, have faith in your casting ability to let the line roll over and do what it was designed to do. And look what happens. Nice brown. Nice fish. Nice fish. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Look at that. Look at that. Is that a look at that? You hold your rod? Yeah, if you wouldn't mind. Absolutely. He took the hopper, which I think I see a hackle sticking out of it. I think my hopper's due for a change. So we'll take that out. Hold on. He wants it so much. And now we've got a yeah. dropper set up here, so we'll get deal with that. So again, that's the upstream approach and why we systematically work up the run so we don't spook the fish. And it's just a classic dry, fl dry fly approach, taking advantage of the fish's blind spot, as we refer to it. Just a gorgeous, gorgeous brown. This hunting fish is just a riot. Not a lot of fish, but just a, a real intimate contact. I love it. We'll just let him swim out of our hands, go back and rest, and hopefully another angler can share the same experience. Perfect. Here it comes. Go! Oh! I got it. So do I. I actually caught the fly. Patience is the number one thing with when trying to find these fish, hunt these fish. You have to allow the fish to work its cycle. If it's going to go downstream of you and work back upstream, you have to let it do that. If you're not sure if it's a fish, you have to sit there sometimes, wait 5, 10, 15 minutes and see if you see a tail, maybe a head, maybe a peck fin, see movement. You're always waiting to see what's going to happen. You're always waiting to get just the right moment before you commit to anything. So that fish just rose quite a ways upstream of where I thought he was. So it's a good thing that I waited now I can slowly move up to his position. Hopefully he'll be in the same place and hopefully he'll be interested in feeding. <laughs> well, he's, I'm trying to keep him out of those sticks over there. Try to lead him, turn him on his side and lead him this way. I think we're pretty clear down below here to land him. Yep. He's not 20, but he's a nice fish. Get his head up. Yeah, eh? Yeah, I'll get his head up. Right. Whoop. Right now. Oh! <laughs> I thought he wasn't. You know, he's. Uh, just came up he's got there. weed over his face. Usually, that's that settles yeah. him down. There he. Whoa. <laughs> he's hot, eh? Yeah. Well, I got a little closer to you.
That's <laughs> right. If I was smart, I would have reeled up my line, but... All that stuff, right? Uh, come on, buddy. There, he's in the mud now. He's disoriented. There we go. Yeah. That's the way it's supposed to be. Yeah. I'm going to hold that, and I'll take your rod for you. Okay. Dave actually spotted that fish. I don't think any other human being in the world would have been able to, uh, to spot that fish. Oh, there's the fly. Uh, but Dave spotted the fish when we were walking up here. The fish wasn't rising. Dave said, I know that fish will eat. And uh, as much confidence as I have in Dave, I wasn't sure about that, but he did eat. And uh, you know, Dave up there high on the bank talked me into it. Uh, got me pretty excited when he said, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming. And he ate the fly. Nice, fat, wild brown trout, the kind we've been hunting. <laughs> well, we were fishing for a riser up there and he wasn't interested and uh, this looked awfully good with that overhang there and all those sticks and um, good feeding lane. So I let the fly go down there and uh, lo and behold, there was a nice brown trout in there. A gorgeous little fish. Yeah, it was blue. Oh, marks on the gills. Yeah, God, they hold the net there, Tom. We'll show it to the viewers and let it get on its way. What a beautiful. Well, I, I, it's been a great experience. Tom and I have learned so much from Dave about how to hunt for trout. It's just been incredible, hasn't it? It's been fun. It's been fun. fun and Hopefully you've learned a lot as well and you can add these tricks and techniques to your repertoire. For more information on this show and others in our series, please visit us on the web at thenewflyfisher.com. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week.